Good afternoon, everybody. All right, today we're going to talk about emerging viruses. These are what everyone is interested in. Emerging virus is the agent of a brand new infection or something that has been around and we didn't recognize it, or even something that's reemerged, it's gone away for a while. For example, dengue and much of the southern hemisphere was gone by the 80s because of mosquito control. And then we stopped using DDT and it came back, so it, it reemerged. And ever since we started doing agriculture and large populations of people started to congregate, we, got, we picked up new viruses. So before there were large numbers of people together, it wasn't enough to sustain transmission, but as soon as we got together, that happened, and viruses have been infecting us uh, ever since. So we touched a little bit about, upon this last time in a few other lectures. So an emerging virus can have an expanded host range, so it can be a virus that we know about, and all of a sudden it expands its host range. And chikungunya virus, is an example where the host range was limited to a certain kind of mosquito by a certain kind of mosquito and then a mutation was selected for in the mosquito and it, uh, in the virus and it could then replicate in the new mosquito. Uh, very frequently it, it, an emerging virus is transmission of a virus from an animal to humans and this is called zoonosis. So an animal virus that infects people is a zoonosis. The H7N9 influenza virus in China that's infecting people, this is a zoonosis because it keeps going from some kind of bird to people. It's not going from person to person. Uh, once it goes from person to person and sustains transmission, then it becomes a human virus. It's no longer a zoonosis. All virus, human virus infections, of course, were a zoonosis at some time or other. That's how they started, because we didn't really invent any viruses of our own. Cross-species infection can establish a virus. So again, a zoonosis, SIV to HIV, great example of a, of a zoonotic infection that became a human infection. The transfer of SIV from chimps in the early 1900s to humans, and then the propagation of the virus in people. Sometimes these cross-species infections don't go anywhere. Ebola and Marburg, we believe, go from bats to humans, or perhaps through some intermediary uh, animal. But they don't, they do not, um, they do not establish transmission. Speaking of transmission, yeah. They do not establish transmission from human to human. So every time you read of an Ebola outbreak or a Marburg outbreak, it's a brand new transmission from bats to people. So those are the different kinds of things that happen. So the press is really infatuated with emerging viruses, even though infections have been emerging as long as there's been a press. They are really uh, amazed. Here's an, a Newsweek headline. What year is that? Can anyone see? 1995? And this is when Ebola first began to uh, rear its head. What else is out there? Well, you should be able to answer that question. There's a lot out there. Most of it doesn't bother us. And this, of course, is the description of the first uh, zoonotic infection that we really paid attention to, Lassa fever virus in the 60s, in, um, first in Nigeria. And part of this story took place at, at Columbia, which I think I've told you about. So this is a pretty cool book, too. There are a number of factors that drive emergence. What makes viruses go from animals to people? These are obvious in many ways physical and environmental factors, the microbe and the virus itself, the virus changing like we talked about last time, uh, stuff having to do with ecology, social, political, economic factors, human and animal. For example, we domesticate lots of animals, so pigs and chickens and turkeys are good sources of influenza virus infections. We, we put them together in such huge numbers and then we have handlers going in and taking care of them. It's a good way to get infected and genetic and biological factors. They all uh, play into this emergence. This has always happened. As long as humans have been around and pre-humans, they've picked up viruses. And of course, animals pick up viruses from each other. Can you think of an example we talked about where one animal picked up an infection from another? Happened in Africa. Did I hear AIDS? 
Come on, you know it, you know it. Don't be scared. AIDS, you're right, the precursor to AIDS. What was that called? SIV. So chimps gave it to people. And who gave it to the chimps? Did you? It was me. Yeah, it was yeah, you. you got it. <laughs> old world monkeys, right? Ch a chimp ate an old world monkey at some point. Also, another uh, group of um, SIVs seem to have gone from chimps to monkey to gorillas. So there are lots of examples of that. Uh, a number of things contribute, you know, we're taking over the globe and we're cutting down the rainforest and, you know, workers go in and they encounter new viruses all the time, uh, but we're spreading all over the globe. The population is huge, especially in certain places, and that facilitates, of course, virus spread. And if you have contact with animals, that's, of course, where you get your emerging infections from. So this is a pretty cool map showing you all the lights. Uh, in North and South America, and then all the fires here in South America where they're burning down uh, the rainforest. Here are some other factors that lead to viruses jumping from animals to people. Evolution, of course, is always at the center because that's what viruses do. That's what makes them able to go into a new host, right? They can have all these sequences. They are quasi-species, and one of those, even one, can make the jump. Then we have environmental changes here, all the empty tires, of course. That's just one example, carrying mosquitoes around. We alter ecosystems all the time. Um, deforestation, population we talked about. A lot of poverty so that sanitation is poor and it's a good way for infections to spread. Poor hygiene and so forth. No public health at all, no immunizations. And finally, uh, rapid air, air travel which really helps viruses move around, probably helped West Nile virus come from Israel to New York City back in 1999. So the air routes are amazing. They go everywhere. And when you track the spread of new viruses, they often follow these air routes. So back in 2009, a brand new influenza virus strain emerged. It first emerged uh, in Mexico, and then it was found in California and Texas, and then China. And it, when you track its spread, it, it parallels the air routes. So the airplanes take infected people all over the place. There was a, just a new case of this H7N9 in Taiwan. Guy was working in Shanghai for a couple days, flew back to Taiwan, and he, brought, he was sick. He was sick for three days, and then they realized he had this virus. So evolution, of course, is, plays a big role in these emerging viruses, these zoonotic infections. You, know, you need uh, biodiversity. You need to have lots of different sequences so that when one of those finds itself in a new host, it takes off. Uh, but as you will see, the virus has to be in the right place at the right time. That's why we don't have all that many zoonotic or emerging infections, because it's not easy to do. And once the virus is in a new host, presumably undergoes adaptation and selection for something that replicates very well in that host and maybe transmits. Although we haven't seen this happening in real time. We don't have the precursors of all of these zoonotic infections, the one that was in the animal before people. You know, we don't have that for SIV. We don't have the 1921 virus so that we could see exactly what had to go on for it to adapt to humans. And even today, this outbreak in China of H7N9, people are saying, will it adapt to transmit? If it did, this would be quite interesting, not for the people who get sick, but then we would have the before and the after transmission, and we would know what kinds of changes are associated with that, because we absolutely do not have any such information for any virus. And here's an example of things that we can encounter. This is the Amazon North region of Brazil. And each of these little words is the name of a virus. There are 183 of them. These are all arthropod born uh, and other vertebrate viruses, mosquitoes and ticks and so forth, uh, that have been identified in this part uh, of Brazil. And as you know, in, in many of these areas, there's deforestation occurring. So workers are going to encounter these mosquito borne viruses. They're going to be bitten by mosquitoes and perhaps one of them one day carries a virus that will take off uh, in that human. So lots and lots of opportunities. These are just viruses that have been isolated in cell culture. And there are many more out there that can't be grown and which exist, thousands and thousands most likely. So here is a table of some uh, viruses that we call either emerging or re-emerging. Uh, dengue, of course, um, re-emerged because of the used tire trade and stopping the use of DDT. 
Ebola virus is a brand new virus that uh, went into people not too long ago. So is a hantavirus, HIV, of course, we have talked about. For some of these, we don't know um, the origin, like HTLV. Influenza virus clearly is originating in birds and probably reassorts in other animals and all of these others. These are all new viruses that have emerged in the last uh, 20 or 30 years that we didn't know about before. Uh, in West Nile, for example, isolated in the 1940s. So these are just some of the ones that we talk about, but there are many more and they're, they're more identified every, every day. And what I would like to do today is to talk about some of the general principles that govern emergence. And then we'll go over, I think, four different examples of recently emerged uh, virus infections. So to do that, we have to look at this kind of display first. This is the general interactions of hosts with viruses, all the different things uh, that can happen. So you hear that you have four different outcomes uh, of the infection of a host with a virus. And we'll talk about each of these. So we have stable uh, interactions where the virus has a host, it's adapted to it, replicates in the host, spreads from host to host, that maintains the virus. Uh, the evolving um, situation, that is when virus is introduced to a brand new host. This is what we're talking about today, emerging viruses. That's why we have a big red arrow here. So the introduction leads to evolution because that's a brand new virus for the host. And so it's going through sequence selection until it gets to a population that is adapted to the host. And that can take many years, as we'll see later on today. Sometimes you have a dead end. And this happens a lot, I think, when people encounter viruses uh, in animals or vectors, the virus goes into the human, may replicate a bit, and then stops. Your immune system clears it, and it never goes beyond that. Or there can be some cases where a dead end uh, actually leads to disease, but you don't transmit it to anyone else. And, and finally, there are cases where you're infected and there's no replication because the host is resistant to that particular virus and infection is blocked. All right, so those are the four different uh, kinds of uh, relationships. So here is, a, here is an expansion on stable uh, host virus interactions. So that's the green box down here. And the, the reason why there are arrows connecting all these boxes is because the viruses in a stable relationship, uh, which you'll see in a moment an example of, can either infect a resistant host, it can infect a dead end host, it can infect and cause an evolving infection as well. So all these are interplayed and in, playing in, in terms of viruses traveling between them. Now in a stable uh, host virus relationship, the host and the virus for the most part survive. I mean, some hosts may die, but the population lives on uh, and both multiply. And some of them are permanent, as far as we know, for as long as we've been studying these, like measles virus has been around for thousands of years, herpes, who knows how long, at least from the dinosaurs, we, I don't know about in people, cytomegalovirus, smallpox. So a continuous cycle of infection and transmission with mortality, but not 100% mortality, so the host survives. And sometimes this kind of stable relationship includes more than one species, like influenza viruses between humans and humans, of course, but may also involve swine and birds. Uh, the Flavy virus is carried by mosquitoes and, and other uh, mosquito-borne viruses. I think we'll talk about a couple of those. Uh, and then they're evolving host virus relationships. We have a virus that's in some kind of stable relationship, probably not with a human being, in some an other animal cycle, and somehow we get infected with it, uh, and the virus replicates and begins to transmit among humans, so it evolves. It's an evolving uh, relationship, and these are typically unstable and unpredictable in terms of the virus, whether the virus will work or not, what the genome sequence looks like, and the outcome can be nothing or it can kill you as Ebola infection does. And some examples, uh, the introduction of two different viruses, smallpox and measles, to uh, natives of the Americas uh, by old world colonists. So, you know, the Americas were pretty much left alone for many years and then all of a sudden Europeans started coming over. And viruses had established them, uh, themselves in the Europeans because the populations were big enough. And they were doing um, agriculture and keeping farm animals together. So those viruses had gone into uh, the old world. And when they came over to the new world, 
Some of them may have been sick. Back then, no one understood disease, certainly not infectious disease. So if you were sick, you went on the boat anyway and you brought the, the infection to the New World. And because the people in the New World hadn't seen any of these viruses, they were incredibly susceptible and these took off. And that's why uh, it killed a lot of them initially. West Nile came here in 1999. We had no West Nile in, in uh, the US, Canada, Mexico. It was introduced uh, in 1999, it came from Israel and it spread. It's totally, completely across the U.S. in every state. It's in Canada, it's in Mexico. So that took off and worked really well, of course, because uh, we're humans just like uh, the rest of the humans in the world. Now, sometimes when the virus uh, goes into uh, a, new, um, a new host, uh, it, it can spread, it may increase its virulence. The host may change, so for example, if there are famines or wars that may allow greater virus spread. World War I and influenza, 1918 influenza probably spread was facilitated uh, by the movement of troops uh, during the war. So this kind of stable, uh, this kind of evolving relationship not only involves animals, non-human animals to humans, but humans to humans. West Nile and smallpox and measles are examples of that. A dead end interaction, the virus uh, infects a host uh, where it can't be transmitted to any others. All right? um, sometimes the host is killed very quickly. Ebola is an example of this. Uh, the, the infection is lethal very quickly. And there's little transmission except to people who are, say, physicians or nurses working with the patients or close family members. Um, so that's one outcome. The other possibility is that the infected host can't transmit it. So Ebola effectively is not transmitted in any, in any effective way. It's not transmitted by aerosol, certainly not a sexually transmitted disease because you're in such bad shape when you get it that you're not going to have sex. You're not going to be doing drugs, intravenous drugs, because you feel so lousy. So um, many of them are not spread. So these kinds of dead ends don't really contribute to the spread of a natural infection. They can get a lot of headlines because they're lethal, but uh, they're not likely to uh, perpetuate the virus. It's, it's, got an ev it's got a stable relationship in some host species, and for Ebola we think it's bats, and they seem to be fine for the most part, and only when it goes into people. It's a dead-end relationship because it doesn't spread among people. So here's an example that illustrates some of these uh, classifications that we've been talking about. This is an arbovirus, an arthropod-borne virus. This happens to be a virus transmitted by mosquito. And this uh, mosquito bites a wild bird uh, and puts the virus in the bird. Uh, the bird. The virus replicates in the bird, and then other mosquitoes pick it up and transmit it to other birds. So this is the cycle. This is the stable host virus interaction here in this particular uh, cycle. Mosquito, bird, mosquito, bird. And probably the birds are fine. This has evolved for many, many years uh, in the bird. The virus has evolved not to kill it in the bird, but has evolved also to be resistant uh, to disease. Uh, other mosquitoes can pick up the virus occasionally and bring it to other hosts, and there are lots of examples of that, and the mosquitoes can also bite, bite uh, other mammals. And here down at the bottom are, are examples of dead-end infections, dead-end hosts. The mosquito can bite a human or a horse, transmit the infection, may go nowhere in some cases, and there are a number of infections where we know uh, the encephalitis viruses are injected into people or horses by mosquitoes. You get sick can die of the infection, but you do not transmit it uh, to others. Uh, and the reasons for that are not entirely understood. One may be you don't make enough virus in your blood so that if you're bitten by another mosquito, it would pick it up and transmit it to someone else. Or maybe uh, there aren't the right mosquitoes around to transmit it and so forth. So that's a dead end host. And these hosts do not spread the infection. So that's not where the virus is gonna make a living, so to speak. Here is where the virus is existing, right, in, in this stable relationship. But uh, here, it's not really of any use to the virus unless these ended up taking off, but that's not the case here. Uh, here's another example of this. Uh, it's, it's with a tick-borne virus. It's called tick-borne encephalitis virus. This is a flavy virus, similar to dengue virus. Dengue, of course, transmitted by mosquitoes. This one by ticks, just to show you that ticks can carry viruses as well. And there, here is a stable cycle. Um, between rodents in this case, not birds as in the previous example, uh, but in rodents. And the ticks uh, transmit the virus to their offspring. 
by trans-ovarial transmission. So it's maintained in, this, in the tick species. The tick is fine, it's not sick. The rodent isn't sick, as far as we can tell. So this is the stable relationship. But then it can bite, uh, the tick can bite people for sure. And our colleague Dixon de Pommier just came back with a very nice tick bite the other day, right? That probably had Lyme, uh, the Borrelia, right, in it, but uh, not a virus. But if you go out and collect ticks from this area, and people have done this, they're full of all sorts of interesting bacteria and viruses. So if you're out hiking, you gotta watch out for ticks. If you, if you get ticks on, you make sure that they're not the ones that are problematic, the small ones. So a tick will bite this human transmit a virus. Human can get sick, dead end host though. He doesn't uh, pick up the virus. In this case, you can understand what's the likelihood that this person after getting sick is gonna go back in the woods so that ticks can bite him or her and pick up the virus and spread it to someone else. And sometimes the tick will bite goats. In this case, the tick-borne encephalitis virus is known to replicate in goats and transmit it to people via goat milk. So again, examples of stable and dead-end uh, relationships. Other dead-end infections um, we have mentioned in this course and we'll talk about later, yellow fever uh, virus is maintained in a um, cycle between monkeys and mosquitoes and then when humans intervene, it can be a dead-end but sometimes it, it does transmit among people, and we'll talk about that. Uh, Marburg and Ebola viruses, Hendra Nipah, the SARS progenitor, all of these are from bats. Uh, these, in most cases, are dead ends, except uh, SARS, of course, uh, evolved in people so that it could transmit. And as we'll see, Nipah virus appears to be doing some sort of transmission, although not very effective. Uh, Lassa virus, Hunin, Sin Nombre, these have natural stable cycles in rodents. And when we encounter them, uh, we get a dead-end infection. And actually, most laboratory uh, animal models are, are dead-end infections. You know, we infect mice or hamsters or ferrets in the lab, and very, in very few cases is there transmission. Of course, we're not usually, usually studying transmission, although in some cases, if you want to study transmission, you can adapt the, the models for that, but it, it's, it's not a natural situation. It's very artificial, so it's almost like a dead-end infection. So to get a new infection established in people, there are two general steps. The virus has to be introduced into the population. It has to replicate initially. In that first person who, who killed the chimp in 1921, the virus, you know, the person cut the chimp while butchering it, cut himself. Uh, the virus flowed from the chimp into him, and it had to establish itself in the, in the individual as well. And there, apparently, it was easy to do because, as you know, we're 99% chimp. So the virus found a nice home in a human host. And so often we all have rare encounters with viruses um, and we never know about it because the viruses don't go very far, our immune systems take care of it, uh, and these are not transmitted. So you may go somewhere, uh, even in a city, and pick up a, a virus infection. That would be a human virus most likely, but if you go out into the wilds, you could pick up rodent or other or tick-borne or mosquito-borne viruses and you would never know it and only maybe if we could look at your antibodies one day and see your whole history of, of antibody responses would be, we'd be able to pick that up. So most of the encounters are, are done. They never go anywhere. In order for the virus to proceed, it has to find susceptible and permissive cells in you, and which is not easy because it may not have the right sequence to do that. Um, the density of the population and your health are important. Remember the, the cut hunter who got SIV, probably that happened many times throughout human history, but it probably spread in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s because of the European colonization of Africa, the buildup of large population centers, development of prostitution, uh, and the healthcare mistakes that the Europeans made by reusing syringes, for example. But most of the time, um, these are dead ends. And you have to have, of course, in the end, a chain of serial infections or transmission for the virus to endure. Um, unless you keep re-encountering it, in the case of Ebola, we re-encounter the virus in Africa because people are always eating bushmeat, and the bushmeat is contaminated uh, with the virus. In China, the H7N9 virus continued to infect people, probably from poultry, until they shut down the poultry markets. You know, they have live poultry markets in many parts of China, and that uh, fosters infection. You shut that down, you cut down infection. 
And we always find new ways to encounter new viruses. Uh, a lot of these things on this table we didn't do many years ago. You know, at one point there wasn't air travel, we didn't build dams, uh, irrigation was very different, wildlife parks, hot tubs, that's a good way to get a virus infection, air conditioning, blood transfusions, big time transplantation. Moving uh, livestock and birds long distances is a good way to move viruses as well. Deforestation, used tires, daycare centers. Right? There was a time when there were no daycare centers. Now this is a great way to transmit infection. So we really provide lots of opportunities for zoonotic viruses to contact us. And here are some examples where um, we've gotten transmission of infection to new hosts. Uh, so one way is to be in contact with with bodily fluids. And if you hunt, for example, and eat wild game, you're, you can get infections from the, the animals that you are hunting. Uh, even if you work at a zoo, or if you have a pet, you gotta have a pet hamster and it can have a virus in it. And if you happen to be immunosuppressed, it could infect you. Uh, sharing a resource with different species is something we'll talk about today. Um, in many parts of the world, fruit bats, pigs, and humans share the same space. And so the bat viruses uh, get to the pigs and then the humans. Sharing of vectors. So this virus is spread by mosquitoes that feed on multiple animal species. So that's a good way to transfer infection. And finally, of course, we go in the jungle and try and clear it. And so we're bitten by mosquitoes that are part of another cycle. We talked about this before. So let's talk about some specific uh, emerging infections. It turns out that there are a lot of them that originate in bats. 20% of the world's mammals are bats. And these guys are pretty mobile, uh, and um, they seem to be pretty healthy with a lot of viruses in them. Just this week, a paper was published in PNAS showing that, uh, well, they went and they, they sampled hundreds and hundreds of bats from places on the world where a lot of these new infections emerge. And they found all sorts of viruses in them, in particular what they think is the precursor of hepatitis C virus, the flavivirus that causes liver disease. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of new viruses that came from bats. This happens to be a fruit bat, by the way. This guy is about three feet long. It's not one of these tiny micro bats. You know, there are bats that are this big. This guy is this big. Right? It's tough to sample these guys, but people do it. They, they net them and they get blood from them and see what viruses they have in them. And this uh, fruit bat or flying foxes, another name for them, has, has been the source of a couple of different <coughs> viruses, including Nipah and Hendra viruses. And Nipah and Hendra cause disease in various animals, including humans. These are paramyxoviruses, like measles virus, part of the same family. And in fact, a study done in bats years ago shows that they're full of different sorts of paramyxoviruses. So who knows, maybe these were the source of measles. Maybe the bat virus got into cattle uh, years ago, and then from cattle it went to people. So that's a paramyxovirus. It's enveloped. It has a long negative stranded RNA genome and it has a couple of glycoproteins uh, in, in, the, in the membrane, which are important for attaching uh, to the cell surface. So Nipah virus was first recognized during an outbreak of disease in 1998. This happened on pig farms in Malaysia. And there was a very unusual outbreak of both of a disease with respiratory components and uh, neurological disease. So many of the pigs were sick, and then the people who handled the pigs got sick too. There were 105 human deaths, and to stop this outbreak, they killed a million pigs. It's really sad, they actually just dug big pits and pushed the pigs into them and covered them up. They didn't actually kill the pigs first. Um, you can find movies of that on the internet. Um, when you have a lot of pigs, and you have to kill them all at once, it's not easy to do. So the, where this came from, this virus came from fruit bats. So a lot of very interesting s sleuthing showed that fruit bats uh, carry this virus. It was very similar to the virus that infected pigs and humans, but not identical because again, it evolves once it gets into people. The fruit bats are infected, they're fine. They're flying around with this virus. They excrete it in their urine. Um, the, fruit far the pig farmers plant mangoes next to the pig farms. Um, and I guess the mangoes are part of what they feed to the fit pigs, but the fruit bats like to eat the mangoes. So they come at night and they eat, and when they do, they urinate and defecate on the fruit and it covers them with virus. 
Uh, and then the next day, the, the fruit is given to pigs, uh, or it's picked up by a human, they get contaminated, and they transmit the infection to pigs. The pigs get sick, and then, of course, the lots of pig handlers. When you are working on a pig farm and you have to take care of the pigs, you're pretty close to them. You're right next to them. You're touching them a lot. So it's very easy for infections to go back and forth. So that's what happened here. Um, so this has since spread elsewhere. It is big in India and Bangladesh now. And they couldn't figure out for a long time how it was getting transmitted to people because they, they weren't doing pig farming. But it turns out that um, people like to drink date palm sap. So there's a, a certain kind of date. It grows on palm trees. They pick it and they make sap from it. So they get sap from the tree. They cut the tree open and, and then they store it in these big vats near the village. And they would leave the vats open. And at night, bats would come in to drink the date palm sap. And they would urinate in the, in the sap and put virus in it. And the next morning, people would come. And this was a delicacy. They would drink it, and they would get sick. And they solved that problem by, what do you think they did? Low-tech solution? They put covers on the date. You know about this? Yeah. They put covers. You don't have to immunize. You don't have to tell people to change their behavior. You just put covers on. That really uh, took care of a lot of it. But it still happens because whenever there's a solution, there's an exception, right? So there are still outbreaks going on there. And it seems to be transmitted among close families. So when someone dies, the family is involved in the preparation of the body. So there's close contact. And that transmits the infection. So there's no aerosol transmission, but rather uh, transmission when people get close together. So of course, the, the dead people are are contaminated and they have bodily fluids that are contaminated so then the people helping them uh, get sick as well. And these, are, these infections continue to today. You can still find uh, outbreaks of uh, Nipah in these countries. And so people are trying to work on other solutions that would prevent it entirely, like vaccines. Uh, the other virus from uh, flying foxes is Hendra virus, which is a part of Australia. And this was first identified in September of 1994. An outbreak on a farm where they raise racing horses, killed 14 horses uh, and one of the trainers who takes care of the horse. Uh, and again, the idea was that it spread from flying foxes to horses. So at night, the flying foxes probably come into the stalls to find some food. They contaminate the stall with, with uh, Hendra virus because they're excreting it in their urine and feces. Uh, and then the horses pick it up. Uh, and here there is, um, there, there can also be transmission if you are taking care of someone who's died and you're not sure of why they died. Early on in the epidemic, there was some transmission, but this doesn't uh, move effectively from person to person. And if you look in, if you just Google Hendra, you will see that there are still outbreaks uh, of this infection in racehorses. So this happens when you build a farm for racehorses right next to the forest where the bats are. This is what I mean by encroaching on uh, other ecosystems. Uh, just a side note, I got an email to my podcast, I think about two years ago, um, from a guy who said he was one of the vets who took care of this uh, initial outbreak in uh, Hendra. And he, was, he was willing to come on the, the podcast and talk about it. So that would be pretty cool. Uh, so this shows you where these two viruses are located and the hosts for them. So both Nipah and Hendra. Uh, let me see if I can read this. Okay, so these are, the red dots are fruit bat collection sites positive for either virus, Hendra or, or Nipah. So they've combined the two into a genus called Hennepa virus. So those are the red dots. You can see uh, initially the isolations in Malaysia and, and that's spread throughout Southeast Asia. There's also been an isolation here. What's the name of this island? Madagascar. Madagascar, thank you. That's where those little furry guys are, right? All right. All right, and so there's been one isolation there. Now we have uh, Hennepa virus outbreaks. You can see India, Bangladesh outbreaks. Here, is the, here are the outbreaks in Australia of Hendra, basically located, uh, restricted to this area. Uh, and then we have the host ra home range of the, of the fruit bats, the teropus, which is the green box, which is this. So in theory, those bats can go pretty far, so they could bring the virus as far as this area here. And then this is a different sort of fruit bat has a bigger host, a bigger range as well. And in fact, there's even been a, a virus isolation over here in the absence of disease. So these potentially have uh, quite a, a range and could spread 
uh, well beyond if, if the conditions are right, but so far they haven't happened. Again, the most of the outbreaks of Hendra are still in Australia and um, Nipah in India and Bangladesh. Uh, the diseases of colonization that we talked about uh, have similar beginnings, but it goes from people to people. We talked about this. I think this is a duplex, a duplicated slide, but anyway, uh, smallpox came from the Far East to Europe, where it spread in Europe as European cities grew, uh, and then it was brought to the New World by the colonists who killed three and a half million Aztecs in two years. Uh, and that's why they were able to con conquer these societies without many weapons, because the infections wiped everybody out, smallpox and measles. Another example of introduction of a virus where it normally is not is yellow fever. Now, yellow fever is a tropical disease. It is spread uh, typically between monkeys in what's called the jungle cycle. The monkeys are fine and the mosquitoes are mine. These are Aedes aegypti. You see the mosquito is quite happy even though he has yellow fever virus. But occasionally we encroach upon this. And do you know why we discovered yellow fever virus? Do you remember the first lecture in this course? What, was, what were we doing that had us encounter it? We were digging something. It was between North America and South America. <laughs> it's Panama Canal. It's, you know, it's a tropical area. It's full of mosquitoes with yellow fever virus. And the workers went in and they started dropping like crazy from yellow fever. So that's when Walter Reed and his buddies all went in and figured out that it was being transmitted by mosquitoes. And if you kept the mosquito population down, you could do it. So when people walk in and get bitten by the mosquito, uh, they will get yellow fever. So what we have done is imported it into the US at some point. So through slave trade, for example, we brought in uh, yellow fever in this case uh, in 1700s, late 1700s, it came from Santo Domingo. And this is the outbreak of yellow fever in Philadelphia. So it's spread from the south all the way, uh, as I think it went as far as Boston. And here's this outbreak in uh, Philadelphia. So the right mosquitoes are there. The population density is high enough, spreads from person to person. So you, you bring this virus in and it causes an outbreak. And in fact, Thomas Jefferson even said that it would discourage the growth of great cities. Of course, he didn't understand that in the winter the mosquitoes would go away, which is what happened here. As soon as the temperature drops, the mosquitoes go away, and that's the end of the outbreak. But the, the point here is that you change the pattern of an infection, which is normally uh, between mosquitoes and monkeys, and then you pay the price. So there's not a lot of yellow fever left globally. There is still some in certain places, but there is a vaccine that you can use to prevent it. Another way we can introduce new viruses is by changing our environment, and polio is a really neat example of that. Uh, I told you before that polio has been around since Egyptian times, shown by this, well, ancient Egyptians. I had a writer, a, a listener, write in once and say, we're all Egyptians, but these are older ones. And so this was around a long time ago. You can tell by this individual with um, a foot, a leg drop, typical of polio. Uh, but it was never epidemic. It existed in a stable host virus relationship spreading slowly among people. But then as, as population centers grew and we improved our sanitation, we delayed infection until we were five, 10, 15 years old. And at that age, it was more likely to be paralytic. So we call it a disease of modern sanitation. And so you can see here in the US, this is the incidence, annual reported cases starting in the 1800s, just a few. Then all of a sudden the 1900s began, boom, big outbreaks of polio because we, were, we improved sanitation, we built sewers, and there wasn't sewage on the street anymore. So you, in, uh, you would initially get infected in the pre-sanitation area, you would get infected routinely near birth, and now you're delaying that until later. And when you do that, you get outbreaks of poliomyelitis. So again, we change the pattern of infection. It's not a new infection, but we change the pattern by the things that we do. Here's an example of how the climate and animal populations can infect a zoonotic infection. Uh, and this is a disease called hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, first found in the Four Corners area, right there, New Met, where the four states come together uh, in 1993. And it initially was killing a lot of the very healthy local residents. Uh, it turned out it was caused by a virus, um, which is today called Sinombre virus. 
It happens to be endemic in this particular mouse, Paramiscus maniculatus, about 30% of wild mice. If you go out and catch wild mice, 30% of them are virus positive. And so this, this virus got into people and caused this very serious respiratory syndrome. Uh, just an aside, it was originally called Muerto Canyon virus because that's where it was near, near the first place it was isolated. So one of the things you do when you find a new virus, one of the ways you can name it is by the place where it came from. But the people who lived in Muerto Canyon didn't want a virus, a deadly virus associated with them. I guess it would be bad for tourism. So they petitioned the CDC. The CDC came up with a couple of different names and they didn't like them all, so they ended up calling it C. nombre. Right? Anyway, that is a hantavirus, which is an RNA virus with three different pieces of negative strand RNA. And it has glycoproteins in its uh, envelope as well. Now, why did this emerge in 1993? Well, it turns out that up until that point, the weather was pretty dry in that area of the country. But in 92, 93, there was a lot of rainfall all of a sudden. And this produced a lot of food growing outside, including pignon nuts, which are native to that area, and which the deer mice like. This is Paramiscus maniculatus. So the deer population, the deer mouse population increased tremendously because there was more food for them. And as a consequence, they began to encounter people more often. And what happens is the mice excrete the virus in their droppings and urine, contaminate, get in your house, they contaminate your floors. And when it dries and you're sweeping, you aerosolize it and uh, you inhale it. Now these viruses are in, are in, uh, and related viruses are uh, in a lot of mice. So if, you're, if you have a house one day and you have droppings, mouse droppings, don't sweep them up. Don't vacuum them. You're supposed to spray them first with, with a, a, something that will kill the virus, get them wet, and then, then collect them later. Um, because that'll just make an inhalant. So we're not the natural host, so the virus comes into us, boom, we get serious disease. Now it turns out by looking at sera from people collected, it's been around since 1959, so it's probably been going to mice, from mice to humans at least that long, maybe even longer, who knows. But it's a great example of how a changing condition leads to this outbreak. This is the distribution of this particular mouse uh, in the United States. All, each of these yellow um, dots is where virus has been isolated, see nombre virus from this mouse species. Um, and there, have been, there are other viruses that are related that are isolated from uh, other species as well. And this, as of not, 2003, there were 349 cases and there have been more since then. Uh, in fact, just last summer, there was a small outbreak of HPS at Yosemite National Park. And there were people who were camping out in these tent cabins at Curry Village. And what happens is the mice were building nests in the walls. These are wooden cabins. And they would urinate and defecate in there and it would get aerosolized and the people staying in the tents inhaled it and they got uh, HPS. And I think there was also a, a little outbreak in uh, Adirondacks upstate as well. So this continues to go on. If you catch it early, you can treat it, but uh, it can kill you if you don't catch it early enough. Now these hantaviruses are all over the place. They're called New World hantaviruses. So C. nombre is in the mouse Paramiscus maniculatus. Here in New York, we have a slightly different mouse called Paramiscus uh, leucopus, uh, and they have their own viruses. And then you can see throughout North and South America, there are all sorts of, uh, these are um, different species of rodents and uh, viruses are in some of them, like these orange ones have viruses that are associated uh, with human disease. So there's lots of potential to encounter this. You have to really think carefully when you're out uh, in the wild or in cabins that could have mice in them to be careful not to put yourself at risk for this kind of infection. So these are warnings that uh, lots of diseases are out there. And again, it's a question of intruding upon another relationship. The virus in Paramiscus, the mice are fine. The virus circulates among mice by uh, contamination with urine. They also groom each other and spread the virus. The mice are fine. When we intrude on this, problems arise. Uh, another interesting uh, zoonotic infection is SARS. And this is a cool story to tell. This began in February of 2003 with this email from ProMedMail. ProMedMail is a very interesting website, promedmail.org. 
where they collect disease outbreak information and on a daily basis you can see what's going on throughout the world. So if you're really a disease geek, this is a really cool site to look at. Uh, this one was from this fellow. I received this email and found nothing. Do you know anything about this problem? Have you heard of an epidemic in Guangzhou? An acquaintance of mine from a teacher's chat room lives there and reports that the hospitals have been closed and people are dying. And so this was the first clue uh, that something was going on in China. And of course, China didn't tell the world about this outbreak for quite a while, and so it spread extensively before we were able to contain it. There was an outbreak of severe atypical pneumonia, which began in this province in China. It turns out it began actually in November of 2002. That's where we are in China right here. Uh, 305 cases and five deaths in this particular outbreak. Uh, the disease had a pretty uh, short incubation period, fever, typical flu-like symptoms. Uh, and then uh, proceeding to serious pneumonia, the virus going down into the lungs and causing uh, difficulty in breathing. Uh, this spread beyond it very quickly. There was a Chinese doctor who had treated some of the first patients in that initial outbreak. He went to the Metropole Hotel, which is right here in Hong Kong, and he stayed on the ninth floor. He got sick the next day, and he went to the hospital. He died that same day that he went to the hospital. But just being in the hospital one night, he spread the infection to 10 other people, and this being an international city, they all flew off somewhere else, and they didn't know they were infected, of course. They went to Singapore, Vietnam, Canada, and the US, and they spread the infection to others as well. And eventually, this virus went to 8,000 people in 29 countries. It has a 10% mortality rate. So this, this doctor helped really spread this. He's sort of like the, the European colonists of Africa. He helped spread this infection beyond uh, where it was. And they have done extensive studies of this hotel to map exactly how he spread this infection because they looked at all the wind patterns and so forth and they can exactly figure out how he spread it to the other patients. So this is a little map of the epidemic spread from the Hotel Metropole. Here is patient, uh, the doctor who took care of patients in Guangdong. He went to the hotel and then he spread it to all these individuals here who then went on to different places, Vietnam, Singapore, the US, and uh, you have here in the US one healthcare worker infected, Ireland, Canada, and so forth. So it was a very interesting epidemiological story. What is SARS? It's a coronavirus. We just talked a little bit about these viruses in, in this course. They are enveloped uh, positive strand RNA viruses. They're rather large particles. And they have the largest RNA genomes that we know of, 27 to 30 kilobases in length. And here's what they look like in the EM. Uh, and the name corona comes from this appearance of the virus in the EM. It looks like they have a corona around them. So what happens with this SARS infection? You, uh, you cough and sneeze and you transmit the virus by res respiratory droplets, much as we've talked about before. It enters your respiratory tract multiplies in the mucosal cells of the epithelium. Uh, it does not get into the blood as far as we can tell, remains on the mucosa, but makes its way down into the lungs uh, and eventually may cause a pneumonia in a certain fraction of the cases and very serious pneumonia. And we think that the virus has some unusual genes that allow it to suppress uh, the immune responses of us, of our cells, as, it, as it's infecting us. And this may, in part, make it more severe uh, than a typical coronavirus. So here's the map of the outbreak uh, beginning in roughly February when they first started recording cases, the peak in about March uh, of 2003, and then a uh, decline. And we'll talk about why the, the number of cases went down. Uh, the outbreak was declared over uh, by July of, of 2003, so February to July. Uh, these are the countries globally where the virus spread to, uh, US and Canada. Thailand, Singapore, Australia, Taiwan had a lot, lots in Hong Kong, of course, China in, in total had a lot, and 34 uh, cases in 10 countries in Europe. So here are the, the, the final numbers, 8,000 cases, 774 deaths, or a 9.6% case fatality rate. And that means when you diagnose a case with SARS, how many of those individuals will die? That's what the case fatality ratio is. Why did we, why could we stop it? There are lots of controls placed on travel in Hong Kong. And I like to show this poster, this is a tourist poster. Hong Kong will take your breath away. And it did. 
It actually did. So this is a picture of the Hong Kong airport, which is always a busy place. And they shut it down basically for a period to restrict travel. Um, there were, this was the first time they began to put thermal sensors in airports and that you would walk through this and they could tell if you had a fever. And if you were trying to leave China and you had a fever, they sent you back to your hotel. You couldn't leave until your fever was, was gone. These are continued to be used today. There are lots of posters placed all over China and other countries where the disease had been brought, how to prevent a typical pneumonia, you know, how it's transmitted, what to do to keep yourself from getting infection, hand hygiene and so forth, lots of face masks worn. And so that really was a good response to this infection. It was, it was um, case investigation, tracing of contacts. We knew who went where and who they contacted with so they can Im impose uh, controls on them. We didn't have a vaccine or antivirals, so we used travel restrictions and quarantine and tried to educate the public about the spread of the virus. And in particular, healthcare providers were told, this is extremely contagious, you need to have personal protection to this extent, uh, and that helps also to cut down its spread a lot. So this was a really good example of how there was a pretty good response. It was delayed, but still good in the end when the rest of the world kicked in and we were able to stop this infection. Without any antivirals or, or vaccines, we stopped it and it really hasn't occurred since then. Now, what's the origin of this? Um, if, you, if you look at sera collected before the outbreak, nobody has antibodies to the virus, so it's a brand new virus introduced into the population. Uh, the early cases in, in Guangdong were handlers of animals for the open meat market. So here's an example of the open meat markets. These are animals from either farms or wild caught animals that are butchered and you go and you buy them. So there's obviously a lot of potential for getting infections from these animals. And these animal traders had higher prevalence of antibodies uh, than control groups. So here's some examples. These are antibodies to this virus in humans in Guangdong, depending on occupation. So the wild animal traders had 40% uh, antibody positivity, animal slaughterers were pretty high. Vegetable handlers, not much. Uh, I guess they also might have bought some meat, so some of them got infected. And then some hospital control people who were not involved in any of the illness had 0%. So the, again, the risk factor here is working uh, with the animals. Uh, initially, there was some uh, virus very similar to the SARS coronavirus, isolated from a palm civet in the live animal market. So this is an example of a wild animal caught or, caught or brought in from a farm and, and sold for food in the animal market. That's a palm civet. And they isolated virus from them. And initially, it was thought that this was the source of the virus that infected people. So they started killing all the civets. And, and, but eventually, it was determined that these are not actually the source. Uh, these viruses are all quite similar to each other. The ones you get from civets are not likely to contribute to human infections. And when they went out into the farms or the wild civets and tried to get virus with them, they didn't find any. So that didn't make any sense. So the civet probably acquired the virus in the meat market, not uh, out in the wild. But it turns out that a horseshoe bat is the source of the SARS precursor. So this is a precursor to the human virus. Uh, virus was isolated from these animals in promises quite far apart. A lot of them had antibodies to the SARS coronavirus. And this is the sequence identity, 82 to 92 percent. So again, this is a virus in bats. It's circulating, it's stable in them, it gets into people, it evolves, and, it, and the sequence changes. That's why the bat virus is not exactly the same as the human change. So the idea is that bats are the reservoir for the SARS precursor. It's transmitted to humans, maybe via civets in the meat market. Who knows? So how did it adapt to humans? This was a very interesting story. Lots of genomes were sequenced from isolates from humans and animals, and they focused on the spike glycoprotein, the glycoprotein in the envelope that allows the virus to attach to cells. Human and civet strains, okay? Now the civet is not the reservoir of the virus, but possibly the source of how the virus got into people. Those strains differ by only four amino acids in the spike glycoprotein, and in particular the part of the spike that binds the cell receptor. Those four amino acids cause a huge difference in uh, binding affinity. The receptor for this virus was early on identified as this enzyme called human angiotensin converting enzyme. It's an unusual protein. It's a cell surface uh, protein, but it happens to be an enzyme. It has functions that require it to be on the cell surface. So four amino acid changes influence the binding of this virus uh, to its receptor. So here, here is what happened. 
So human, the human SARS, let's see, the civet SARS spike is shown right here. And here is the receptor, uh, the human receptor interacting with this. So civet virus doesn't bind well to cells expressing the human SARS receptor. It has to evolve further in humans in order to bind well. In fact, the structure of the SARS, the civet SARS glycoprotein together with uh, the human receptor was solved, and that's how this information comes from. Uh, the human SARS spike, that is the virus isolated from people in this outbreak, binds very well to its receptor ACE2. Okay, very nice binding interface here, high affinity. Uh, the civet SARS spike has two amino acid changes, and that completely uh, er, severely reduces the binding of the virus uh, to its receptor. So the idea was that this civet SARS virus came from a bat. It's, rep it's in civets. It didn't, on its own, it can't replicate very well in humans, but a variant of it that had two amino acid changes, which allowed good binding to the human SARS receptor, is the one that caused the outbreak. Now, a, couple, a year later, 2003 to 2004, there was a small outbreak of SARS again in Guangzhou, I believe. Four cases, a separate transmission of virus from presumably fruit bats to humans. Uh, and this virus is shown right here. And this doesn't bind all that well to human receptor. It doesn't have the same amino acid changes that the big outbreak virus had. Okay, and that was restricted. It only infected four people and it never spread. And so that's why we think these interactions are important. So you have the wrong mutation selected for on the spike like a protein, doesn't replicate well in people. But this virus was present in the civet. It's probably a minute part of the civet virome. Uh, and it happened to be the right sequence and it bound ACE really well and it took off. So we think that receptor specificity basically is, was important for this virus to take off. Uh, as I said, th there's been no more transmission of SARS since then. The most recent uh, cases were laboratory acquired in China in April 2004. There were four cases, as I've just talked about, which were new hu uh, animal to human transmissions, but those didn't take off because they didn't have the right uh, receptor interacting sequences. This virus, though, the precursor to SARS is still in animals uh, in China. We sample periodically and we find it. And uh, this wild game has been banned in the markets for the most part, so that has really helped probably keep it down. But if it does come back again, and, you know, someone's always going to sneak in a wild animal. You can go to a, a meat market and say, can you get me a wild civet? And they'll bring you out back and give you a wild civet. So eventually we're going to get spread again, but presumably uh, we will recognize it more quickly. Now, interestingly, just in the past year, there's been another coronavirus emerging um, in the Arabian Peninsula. There have been so far 17 cases, 11 fatalities uh, began in uh, March. And um, it's not SARS, it's a different virus, but it seems to have come from a bat. Um, and uh, here are the cases. There have been a bunch uh, in Saudi Arabia and Jordan. And a number of these sick people were, were uh, traveled to other countries like the UK and Germany uh, where they died. There seems to be a little bit of transmission among family clusters uh, here, for example, and here in Saudi Arabia. The receptor for this coronavirus is different from SARS. It is an enzyme, interestingly, but it's dipeptidyl peptidase 4. And we don't know if this is going to get bigger. Uh, or what, and we don't actually know what, what specific bat the virus came from, but it's an emerging story and we'll see where this goes. So here's the summary of coronaviruses. Uh, up until not too long ago, 2003, there were four known human coronaviruses. Then we added SARS in 2003. The previous coronas all caused pretty mild respiratory infections, so this was very unusual, SARS, and now we have the coronavirus which is called EMC because it was first isolated at the Erasmus Medical Center uh, in Rotterdam, causing severe pneumonia. So SARS came from a bat. And look, these others, by looking at sequences of these viruses and other uh, viruses from bats and other animals, looks like this one came from a bat a long time ago, between 1686 and 1800, from a bat into people. This one probably came from a bat a little earlier. Uh, this seems to have come from a cow in 1890. So these coronas look like they all came uh, from very specific uh, animals, bats and perhaps some others. Uh, one more story. 
canine parvovirus. Uh, this is a, a, a virus that causes very severe disease in dogs. If you have a pet dog, you have to have them immunized against this virus, otherwise they can die of it. This virus just emerged in 1978. It evolved from a cat virus called feline panleukopenia virus, and these are both parvoviruses. These are rather small uh, viruses with a single-stranded DNA genome. Okay, so this evolved just recently. What happened? So it turns out that these feline uh, panleukopenia viruses, they infect cats and some other feline species as well, but they don't infect dogs. Somehow this virus acquired the ability to infect the dog somewhere between 1976 and 1978. And we know that dog thymus cells are susceptible to feline panleukopenia virus. So it could be that somewhere in the world, you know, dogs encounter cats all the time, uh, but this cat virus typically doesn't infect dogs. Maybe in one case it got into the thymus of the dog, it adapted and then spread globally. Uh, this virus, the feline panleukopenia, underwent two amino acid changes that allows it now to replicate in dogs. It acquired the ability to bind to its receptor, the transferrin receptor of dogs. So the receptor for feline panleukopenia virus is the transferrin receptor of cats, but that virus doesn't bind to the same receptor in dogs. Two amino acid changes, the virus uh, can now replicate in dogs and it has since spread globally. Within a year, it went all around the world. So this virus is global, and every dog all around the world is a potential host. And it has further diversified. There are now two strains, CPV2, which infects only dogs, and then CPV2A, which can infect dogs and cats. So now this virus has evolved to be able to infect cats again. So this spread globally. And uh, we think probably, you know, you're in Paris, you step on poop on the sidewalk, you get on the airplane eight hours later, you're spreading it in New York City. That's probably how this virus spread. So two amino acid changes see the world. And, um, you know, Oprah lost her two dogs to canine parvovirus. So they got the headline right here in the Daily News. Parvovirus kills. So she had just adopted these dogs from a kennel. She had them for a few days and they both died. That's because in the kennel they got infected. So what she should have done, of course, was to immunize them, but she didn't have time because they got infected. So this is, this is a really um, bad virus for dogs. So how common are these jumps where you go from one species to another? Uh, a dead end is probably very common. It probably happens all the time. But those that produce sustaining transmissions like HIV and canine parvovirus, those are pretty rare. Can we predict them? No. You can't predict them. We could talk about this for hours, but the end result is no. But we can know what's out there, and we can try and react and be prepared. And that's why the SARS uh, outbreak is so instructive. So what can you do? These are all the things you have to do to be ready. You have to do research to identify the viruses. You develop new technologies for detection. We've done that really well over the years. You have to assemble a database of everything that's out there. I think this is going to be hard to do, but if we knew every virus that was circulating, it would help us to understand what the potential was. Then, of course, you have all this public health stuff. You have responder actions, uh, public health measures, getting vaccines ready, drug stockpiles, quarantines, and cooperation. And this latest outbreak in China, the H7N9, is a great example. Immediately they told the world, we have a problem here, and the whole world can get in, the WHO, CDC, et cetera, can go in and help. So all kinds of, not just science, but public health agency cooperation as well. And then we have a better chance to be ready for the next one. 